Good to uh, see all of you here. It's good to it's good to have people back in church. Amen. Uh, last, I, I want you to know it's a whole lot more fun preaching on this platform when there's people out there. Amen. Last week, I want to thank uh, Randy. He came up on Saturday. We kind of I was afraid that the snow was going to be coming in, and we recorded my message on Saturday night, and it was just me and him and the camera. Amen, and so that was kind of uh, odd, but we, we got through it, and I appreciate him doing it, so we were able to uh, place that on our, our service for Sunday morning, and so just like you, if you were watching it from your couch, I got to actually watch myself preach from my couch, amen, and all I can say is, man, I'm sorry, wow, I, 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 that's unnerving to watch yourself preach on television, amen, so I... I uh, uh, got through it, and but it is so much more fun to be able to look out here and see you. Well, I want to thank you for coming today, and all of you that are joining us on our live stream, thank you for joining in with us, and we're looking forward to a great time together. Well, we are having children's church today, so kindergarten, first and second graders, if you will. Uh, we have somebody in the back there, Miss Megan is there to uh, take you up to children's church, kindergarten, first and second graders. You may be dismissed. And we, as always, will see you uh, here in just a little bit. Amen. Man, I want to also say very quickly about yesterday. We had a great seminar up here yesterday. And for all of you that attended, uh, it was an amazing time. And man, God did some great stuff. We had some great worship time. We had some, uh, a, a great speaker that shared a lot of things about uh, the, the, the video age that we're living in now. And, and so we want to encourage you that if you weren't able to be here, for whatever reason, if you'll go to our Facebook page or to our YouTube page, you'll be able to watch the first half of, of the seminar. We, we've posted that back online. And folks, I would encourage you, please take some time and watch that. It's not going to be like having it being here in person, but I promise you, you will be blessed, you will be encouraged, and you'll be lifted up. And so please do that. And we also have some workbooks that she handed out. We, we, she gave us some. So we have those. So if you would like one of those workbooks, uh, please uh, just ask us. We'll run to the office. We'll get you one. Uh, probably when I say we, I mean Linda or someone else. But I will do it too. I won't make Linda do all the work. Uh, although they, they think I, I do that to them anyway. I make them do all the work. I guess get to be standing up here. But it was a great time. I want to thank our uh, family ministry team for putting that together and for all the volunteers yesterday that helped out. It, it was just a great event. If you did tune in last week, you saw that I shared a message with you about the idea of the, and beginning the series, Connecting to Serve in 2021. This is going to be our theme. This is what we're going to be aiming at. This is what I'm going to be teaching on for several weeks now is to get us as a church to understand we need a connection. Man, we have experienced that more than ever in our lives today that we need to be connected. Amen. I'm telling you, as I said before, it's a whole lot more fun to preach whenever I've got people sitting here and I can connect with you and you can connect back with me and I can see your response. I can see you falling asleep or yawning or whatever it is you do. It just is a whole lot better to do it with people here. We need that connection. And we talked last week, I introduced the message or the series by saying that we were created for connection and we were creating for service. God created us to connect to each other. He connected to, to, to connect to him. We're also created to serve. And so that's what our theme is going to be in 2021. Today I want to carry on with that, the, with that message as we look at some things here. It's in connecting to God in 1 Corinthians. I want us to look at, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 3. And let me get back to where we were on that. There we are. Well, Guys, we're having some problems again. There we go. Connecting to God is the title of our message today. Uh, what I want us to look at today, though, is the most important connection we have, is that we are connected to God. That's our first and foremost important connection that we have. There's a lot of people who try to connect to the church and try to connect to people, and, and we avoid the connection to God, but we see that it doesn't work that way. So our first and most important connection you'll ever have again is the connection you have with God through Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 3, we're going to talk today about a very simple message. As a matter of fact, today will probably be the most simple message that you 
will ever hear from us. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's such a simple message that I think the church needs to hear it more often. And I think people need to hear it more often because this is a message that is given to us with, the, again, the idea that Paul says in, in chapter uh, 11, verse 3. Let's go ahead and stand in honor of reading God's word this morning. The simplicity of Christ. Paul says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you and God, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace. And God, we just pray that as we continue on here today, that whatever we do, whatever we say, Lord, will be honoring to you. And God, I pray that as we go through this time, that we will continue what you have for us. That God, the words that I'm about to say, as always, will not be my words, but they'll be yours. That this is not my message, but yours as well. And that, Father, that the response will be from the people as you desire for it to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we look and we see. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. We look and we see here with the idea of connecting to serve in 2021, the idea of our first connection is between us and that, that uh, vertical connection is between us and God. My friends, can I tell you again, that's the most important connection you're ever going to have. We can look at the connection to the church. We can look at connection to the people. But I'm here to tell you that none of those are as important as what you have a connection with God. And this is where I believe that the world is struggling. This is where I believe that even sometimes, if we're not careful, the church can struggle because we try to connect with people. We try to connect with the church, the body, which we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. But we miss the idea of the connection between us and God. And it is, again, the simplicity of Christ. And it's a much-needed message in the church today to the lost, but also to those who are saved that we must understand what this connection is all about. As a matter of fact, it is so simple, the idea of the connection to God, that so many people are going to miss it. There are people who are serving in churches today that I believe miss the idea, miss the simplicity of the message that we need God through Jesus Christ. So what we're going to be looking at today is the idea of our need for Him. Guys, there we go. Uh, help me out here. Set that up somehow because it's not working. There we go. Our need for Him. It's our need for him, and what I want you to understand is there's a disconnect to God because of our sin. In order, when we begin to talk about connection to God, then that means there's a disconnection. And we need to understand that. The idea of this disconnection is so important. As, the, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 59 too. In Isaiah 59, it says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. So the idea is that we're separated from God because of not anything he's done, but because of our sin. And so a, a person who is lost is separated. They, they have this disconnect from God. And if we're not careful, even in the church, to those who are saved, if we're not careful, we can allow sin into our lives, and that can also then bring a disconnect to us and God. And so we lose that zeal, we lose that excitement, we lose this, this emphasis that God wants to have us placed on making a service to Him through our connection. Now, the idea of the sin is due to the two basic kinds of sin. Because the thing that I want us to understand is that a lot of times in the church, when we begin to talk about sin, or I preach it to you at home, and we begin to talk about sin, we go, well, sin, well, I'm okay, I'm doing all right. But we see the idea of this disconnect is because of two types of sin. One of them is the sin of commission. That's where we're doing things that we shouldn't. Now, we all know that we're command there are commandments in the Bible, amen? But now, a lot of times when I talk about the commandments of God, what do we all think about? The ten. What many of us call the top ten. So we, we go, well, I do that, and I do that, and I do that. But if you'll read through the New Testament, there are a lot of commands that God gives us, amen, in his scripture. We've talked about it before just a few weeks ago, that it's not just the Ten Commandments, but he gives us commands throughout the scripture. One of them is love your enemy, amen? And if we don't do that, guess what? 
It's sin. We're committing a sin. Now, we like to categorize sin and make it sound like this, these heinous acts that we're not doing. And, and, and so I don't do that, and I don't do certain things. I'm a nice guy. I try to do things that I'm supposed to do, that I, and I do not do things that I shouldn't do. But then there's the second group of sin, which is the sins of omission. Now, that is not doing what you should. We all know that the Bible tells us that for us to know to do something and to not do it, it's called what? Sin. Well, guess what, my friends? If there is sin in our lives, then there is a disconnect with God. The Bible just told us that we looked at it in Isaiah, that your sins, your iniquities have separated you from God. And as a result of that, he cannot hear you. He will not look at you because he sees our, the sin that's in our lives. And so we look and we see about this idea of sin that we need to understand is all of us have sinned. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and what? Fallen short of God's glory. That means that we're not perfect like God. So all of us have sinned. We've all done things we shouldn't do. We all done things or shouldn't have not done things we should be doing. And that is sin. And because of sin, then we see as a result of that, the Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of that sin or the result of that sin, the, the ending part of that sin is death. Okay, what's that? Death, that's disconnecting from God. That we, we have a disconnect. Because we are born into sin, we automatically have a disconnect to God. And so we've already talked about how that is the most important connection we can possibly have is between us and God. But he goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life or that connection to God through Jesus Christ. And so we look at it and we see, well, then we, we have that, that, that sin is there. The wage of that sin is death, and there, there must be something done about it. And the Bible tells us then also in Romans 10, 9, for if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what will happen? You will be saved. Not that you might be not that you possibly could be, not if you do an extra thing or two, not if you hold true to that, but if you believe in, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, my friends, listen to me, that disconnection will go away and you will absolutely be saved. Now that is a very simple message, amen? That is as simple as it gets. That's the gospel laid out for us. But the problem is, Paul says in, in verse 3, he said, but I fear something here. I fear for the church. I fear for the message from the church. And here's what he feared. Lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. In other words, so the simplicity of Christ, Satan's perversion of that connection. Now, you remember he brought up the idea of Eve. So you'll remember the story in the, in, in the book of Genesis. The Bible says that Adam and Eve walked with God on a daily basis. And then Satan came and his deception was that he he said, hey, what, is, what would you like to have? And she, he said, look at all that stuff. She said, well, we can have all that, but of the, tree we, of, of the tree of life we can't eat lest we die. And remember what Satan said? Surely? Are you sure that's what he said? So here we look at this and we say, Paul says that he's concerned that the message is going to get lost because it's so simple that here's what's going to happen. Satan is going to come to the world. He's going to come even to the church just as the certain deceived Eve. He's going to say, surely he doesn't mean all. Surely he doesn't mean everything is sin. Surely he doesn't mean you're really going to die. Surely he means that there's got to be another way that you can get to him other than Jesus. Surely he doesn't mean that. And so here we are, we, we, we are being deceived by Satan that he comes and does the same thing he did to Eve. And he says, surely not that. Surely being saved is enough. Surely he didn't mean love everyone. Surely he didn't mean all are going to die. 
But what about this? Surely he doesn't mean that you need help. Surely you can do it by yourself. My friends, listen to me. We are hearing messages even from the pulpits of churches today where pastors are telling you just reach deep down inside yourself and find that goodness and and hang on to it and improve it and be the best you that you can possibly be. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps and man, you and God can be in a right relationship. Can I tell you that's a deception from Satan? That we need Jesus. Surely he doesn't mean it like that. Surely, church, you don't have to take it that seriously. But the fact is, my friends, the only way, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets connected to the Father, again, which we've already declared and established in the very first part of this, is that that's the most important connection you or I will ever need in our lives. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And Satan comes and says, surely it's not like that. Surely it can't be that simple. Surely you can do this on your own. But the point that Paul wanted us to understand is we can only connect to God. Listen to me. We can only connect to God through Jesus. We can only make that connection that we so desperately need if we go through Jesus Christ. What the Bible says is that we believe in him. If, I want you to take your Bibles and look over into the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 12 We see here that John writes, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So we have this idea and we get this connection when we believe in Jesus. And you say, well, is it that simple? And and it's yes, because the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, what's going to happen? We'll be saved. And so John is writing here, and he says that if you believe that you will have this gift, that if you believe in his name, you then can become a child of God. I have a demonstration with this because a lot of people say, can it be that simple? Can it be the idea that all you have to do is believe? And the the, the, the word we have for believe is you have faith. But folks, can I tell you, faith is far more than a head knowledge. And here's where I believe a lot of people, a lot of people in the world and a lot of people, can I say a lot of people at home have a struggle here because when we say it's just the faith, then we go on and we think, well, it's just in the head that I know there was a Jesus. I know these things. But it's not a head knowledge and there's more to it than this faith. As a matter of fact, I have an example here that I want to show you. We sometimes treat this idea of, the, uh, of being saved kind of having this faith in the idea of Jesus. But what I want us to understand is that it says that if I believe not about Jesus, but I believe in him or on him or believe unto him, there's always a preposition before the word Jesus that connects it. That it's not just the idea of Jesus, but you've got to have believing on him, in him. So it's kind of like this. I can tell you that I have a chair here, and I have faith that this chair can hold me up. Amen? Now, I can even come and tell you that I can write books on my faith that this chair can hold me up. I can write songs about it. I can come into seminars about it. I can even go deep theologically and talk to you about the trinity of the chair. Three parts, separately but becoming one. I can talk to you about the leg. I can talk to you about the back. And I can talk to you about the seat and get real deep and say, these three are separate, but you put them together and what do they make? A chair. Man, I can can do seminars about it. I can... We we can have all sorts of things about this. But can I tell you, my faith is not in or on this chair at that point. 
My faith is about the chair. It's when I come to you and I sit down and I come in here. Now, my friends, my faith is in the chair. Why? Because I'm, re- I'm using this chair to hold me up. I'm, I put everything that I have into this chair. It's no longer a head knowledge, but it's a faith in and on. But so many times what I'm seeing and so many times what's going on is people want to say, well, I believe there is a Jesus and I believe these things, but we never put our faith in him or on him. We do all this stuff around him. And this is why that if my faith is about this chair, that I can walk away from the chair because I've never experienced the chair for real. I've experienced a lot of stuff, but not him. That's why then also those, and we are seeing it, my friend, in the churches today. I hear over and over about so many people are walking away from the faith. I'm even, we're even seeing pastors who've written books, led seminars, done great teachings, are now saying, wait a minute. I've experienced something different, and I'm here to tell you that my faith is no longer there. My faith is over here. But I want to tell you something, that once you come and you place your faith in this chair and on this chair, my friend, your life has changed. You will never denounce this because you know it. You've experienced it. But if I've walked around it and I've written about it, I've studied it, I've done all these things, then I can walk away from it as a matter of fact Jesus said that that if you're able to do that he said they have left us because why they were never of us that once you've experienced Jesus and you've put your faith in him and on him you will never want to leave that but if all you're doing is experiencing a head knowledge of what's going on My friends, you can walk away from that easily, and you can lose faith in that easily. You can do all sorts of things and and, and denounce this chair, but once you've experienced Jesus and your faith is in him, you will never walk away from it. That's why this verse holds so true, because Jesus himself said, many will come to me in that day. And they'll say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders? Have we not done so much about you? Man, we've worked for you. We've done these things for you. And the Bible says that Jesus will respond to them and say, depart from me. What? I I never knew you. You did a lot of stuff around it. It's just like this chair. I can do a lot of things to honor this chair. I can do a lot of things to tell you how good this chair is. I can tell you how strong it is, how powerful it is, how it will change your life. But yet never once experience the chair. And my friends, can I tell you today, and Billy Graham, when he was alive preaching, he even backed this up. He said there's a lot of people in churches today that have never truly experienced Jesus, that life-changing effect that he can have on their life. Oh, they may have done something, said something, but they never truly put their faith in him, their faith on him, or faith unto him. They've never used that preposition. And Paul says that I worry that you are being defiled by Satan, that you are being led away, and and, and, and that the message is being thwarted because the way he deceived Eve, he's deceiving the world. We've heard lots of people, and I've shared this with you before, that that, that I I had a, a pastor tell me that he was visiting with a missionary from another country. And one of the things that that missionary uh, says that the people there, that, that as he was from that country, he wasn't a missionary to it, he was a missionary from it. Can you believe that people send missionaries to America to, miss, to make missions, to preach the gospel in America? But he said this missionary came from another country, and he says one of the things that, that, that just baffles him is the terminology we use. 
when we talk about the idea of Christ that we use, and I, and I use it all the time too, and I know we talk about it in the church, but we say we commit our lives to Christ. But he says in those countries, they don't use the word commit because they know what commit is. Commit, you can do it and then undo it. But he says what they use, and they, they mean it with all their heart, they don't say, I commit my life to this, I surrender my life. Because he, what he says is once you surrender, you can't take it back. Once I surrender, listen, if I surrender to an enemy, the enemy doesn't go, oh, never mind. That was cool. I'm glad you did. We'll give you, you'll give it back to you. No, the enemy, if, if, if you surrender to an enemy, you're theirs. You lose. Amen? So you give everything over to them. So when we commit our lives to Christ... We can do that with our head knowledge. But my friends, when you surrender to Christ, it's not a head knowledge. It is a heart. It is giving yourself over completely to him, trusting him in all that you are. And here is where I believe that the church is losing some of this message. It's because we are throwing out a cheap, watered down, all you have to do is say something and bam, you're done. Commit, commit, commit. Well, folks, we know commitment's not, an e not a, a powerful thing anymore. People commit to all sorts of things and take it back. But when we term surrender is used, oh man, when I surrender my life, I don't ever want it back. When I surrender my life, I don't ever want to make the decisions. But I believe that there are so many who are having faith about Jesus. They're studying about it. They're preaching about it. They're worshiping about it. But when we surrender, it's life-changing. When we realize what he's done for us. When we realize that awesomeness it is, and we're going to talk about it even more next week, about actually the, the, the wow of being a child of God. What does that really mean? Wow. We, if we say that we're not getting, without getting goosebumps, we don't know what it means. We don't know what it took. But next week we're going to look at that. So my, my point to all of this is the simplicity is that we need a connection with God, and so many times we are... We, we are losing that connection. We are missing that connection. We are stumbling over that connection because we have somehow gotten caught up in our mind that all I have to do is say something. My friend, it's a surrender. Believe in Him. Believe on Him. Believe unto Him. Surrendering yourself to the purpose. Surrendering yourself to Him, saying, it is you now. We say, I surrender all. Not I commit, but I surrender. So, so when we look at this, that connection, my friend, it's so much more. And if I had time, man, if I had another 20 minutes or so, we could go back up and look in verse 10 and 11 of chapter 1, and I'll just read it real quick. He says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Oh, they saw him. They had fun with him. They they followed him. They did a whole lot of stuff, man. He had huge crowds. But it says they did not receive him. They did not settle in on him or in his name. They, they believed in a purpose. They believed in a cause. But can I tell you, my friend, believing in a purpose, believing in a cause... Believing in a goal, none of those will connect you to God. It's believing in Jesus. That you are willing to surrender everything over to him. Here it is, Lord. I surrender everything I am to you. I surrender. It's not a fact of just doing something. It's not an act of, of, of just being even on the platform. I mentioned in the first service this morning, 
it's, it's not about standing on a platform and even the praise team. It's not about them just up here singing songs. If it is, they don't need to be up here. It's not them playing an instrument. I haven't shared in the first service. I'd rather have one person on a piano singing, leading us that has a heart for God than people who just feel like they want to come up here and sing or people that want to teach or people that want to just come and sit in church. But it's those who have truly surrendered to Jesus. Man, that's where the power comes. That's where the, that's where the, the power and the dynamite power comes. So my question to you as I close up here, have you truly trusted in Jesus? Not have you just said, oh, I, yeah, I, 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 I believe in him. But do you, do you surrender yourself to him? It's a simple message that literally people, even in churches, are tripping over all the time. Because they want to say it's got to be more. If you confess with your heart the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. There you go. Maybe you're here and you say, well, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. I know that time. I know I surrendered to him. I know I gave him everything. But in this time, I have been so focused on other things. I've been focused on so many other things and claiming hold of them and using them for my satisfaction that God, I've lost the joy that I had in my heart for that salvation that God had already given me. My friends, listen to me. Once you have surrendered your life over to Christ, you will not lose that. You cannot give it back. Amen. But you can lose the joy. And that's why David said, God, restore back to me the joy, the joy of your salvation. And I surrender it to you. I believe in all that God is. And I believe all that Jesus is. And I surrender my life over to that. My friend, it's that simple today. And I believe, listen to me, and I'm going to close with this. I believe it is needed desperately by many people in the church today. It's just a simple surrendering of your life. Not commitment to anything. Surrendering to him. Would you do that today? And if you have that, but you sense that there have been some other things that you've allowed to, to get your attention and your focus, but today you want to draw that back. Would you, would you call on his name today, seeking that forgiveness? God, I want that connection. The most important connection. I want to be a child of God. I'd like everybody to bow your head as the praise team comes back up and go and lead us in a song. If you're here today or maybe you're at home and this message is ringing to you and you say, wow, I need, I, I need that. I don't want to be pulled from the simplicity of Christ. But I need that. Would you just say, God... Forgive me. I know that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me. And I know that there is no hope for me apart from that. And God, today, I, I receive Jesus into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin in his name, not because of anything that I've done, but because of him. Would you save me today? You, Satan's already telling you it can't be that easy. You don't need that. Listen. The word of God spoke it. If you're here or you're at home, just call on his name today. Receive him into your life. Surrender to his name. Maybe you're here or maybe you're at home and you say, well, man, I know I'm saved, but I, man, I need a renewal in my heart. Man, I've gotten ritualistic. I've got judgmental. I've got all this, but today I want, I want a tenderness in my life again. So would you call on him? Say, God, Restore back to me the joy of your salvation. That's where the power is. Amen? That's where the power is. Father, hear our prayer today. And if there's anyone here, anyone at home that need to surrender to you, that God, they would do that today. 
Lord, I pray over this congregation. I pray over those at home. Father, you speak to us. You empower us. God, you let us connect with you in a deep, deep way. Father, we love you. We thank you. And do your work here today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. You.